Let's now take a look at what happens when hundreds, thousands, and millions of people make decisions that have medical consequences, and those add up to have impact at the level of the entire population. This exposes the issue of morality and the way that individual behavior impacts public good. We'll explore that with the examples of vaccination and antibiotic therapy. However, to begin with, let's look first at medical intervention and human evolution. Physicians normally focus on individual patients, whereas epidemiologists, public health workers, and evolutionary biologists focus on populations. The chain of causes that links individual decisions by physicians to population level consequences is real and it is not sufficiently appreciated. Medical decisions are now driving human evolution. It's a striking case of cultural intervention in a biological process. This is a nexus where we encounter the issue of individual wel welfare in conflict with group welfare. That welfare of individuals comes into conflict with the welfare of groups when the costs of private decisions are externalized and when public goods are exploited by private interests. Those are really two ways of saying the same thing. In the medical arena, such conflicts have moral, as well as economic dimensions. The probably best way to introduce this is the debate in the United States over how to finance health care. It exemplifies the complexities of these conflicts. A single payer plan, where all must participate, provides the greatest coverage at the lowest cost to the society as a whole. But such plans do not give individuals the freedom to decide whether they want to be insured at all, and if so, by whom. From the point of view of the population, someone who does not join is a cheater parasitizing a public good who is increasing the cost of health care. From the point of view of a young, healthy person, that decision is justified by short-term self-interest. Such conflicts of money and values arise repeatedly at the intersection of individuals and populations. We can see them quite well in the problem of vaccination and herd immunity. The great vaccines sterilize. So measles, mumps, rubella, pertussis, diphtheria, smallpox, TB, polio, those are all vaccines that virtually sterilize the population and do not allow the pathogen to replicate in any vaccinated individual. They protect people for life. They remove them from the pool of susceptibles who might be able to transmit the disease. When the proportion of immune people is high enough, that figure is about 90% for measles, the disease can no longer spread and the population is protected by herd immunity. So in that case, even those who are not vaccinated are protected. They're protected by the high frequency of people who are vaccinated. Herd immunity is a public good created by those who have been vaccinated that protects those who decide not to be vaccinated. That leads us to raise this question. Is refusal to have your child vaccinated a crime? When enough people refuse vaccination, the disease can break out and those who suffer and sometimes die, are usually the youngest. For example, in the California pertussis outbreak in 2010, all of the deaths occurred in infants who were less than three months old, the young and the innocent. The false claim that measles vaccination caused autism caused immunization rates to drop. Measles, which can be deadly, has broken out several times and children have died as a result of this reaction. Are those who promote such falsehoods indirectly guilty of murder or perhaps of manslaughter? Do we need laws that address crimes committed against populations rather than individuals? Our legal system is not particularly well constructed to deal with this. Another issue that arises is that of imperfect vaccines and pathogen virulence. 
Imperfect vaccines can drive the evolution of increased virulence and target pathogen by allowing patients to survive longer and by giving more virulent strains more time to transmit. This has been confirmed in mice and in chickens. Vaccinated individuals benefit, but the indirect cost of increased virulence is externalized to the whole population. Individuals in which the vaccine is ineffective and those who have not yet been vaccinated are then exposed to pathogens that ha have higher virulence. The HPV vaccine and all candidate malaria vaccines are imperfect. They do not sterilize. We should still vaccinate. There's no question about that. Even with imperfect vaccines, because many, many lives will be saved. But we should also be aware of the consequences and prepare for them. Another place where the conflict between individual interest and group interest is striking concerns antibiotic therapy. Antibiotic therapy benefits the individual patient who does incur some cost for, because of local resistance evolution, that means in, the, in that own patient's body, but most of the cost is externalized and diffuse. It's borne by the population as a whole. Agricultural use of antibiotics has a similar kind of logical structure. The individual farmer benefits and the cost of resistance is externalized. That's not, not something that the farmer usually sees himself. The externalized cost is the global spread of resistance. And that is something to which millions of individual decisions have contributed. Those externalized costs have accumulated and they now pose mortal threats to millions of patients. The health of everyone on the planet is now directly or indirectly threatened by the spread of antibiotic resistance. So there are three lessons from this. The first is that the conflict between individual and group interest is real. It's not going away. It can be mitigated but not eliminated. The second is that medicine and public health have changed the human environment radically and are now major drivers of natural selection on traits of medical importance. And the third is that sometimes when medicine solves old problems, it creates new ones. To summarize, private decisions about medical treatment accumulate to have serious public consequences. They exhibit bounded rationality. They seem to make sense, but they are ultimately irrational at both individual and population levels. We need an open conversation about the health consequences of the tensions between individual liberty and social responsibility.